Good evening, dear guests, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Laszlo Kontler, the pro-rector of CU for uh, Budapest. I'm here, to, first of all, to extend a warm welcome on behalf of uh, Professor Charlene Randeria, our rector and president, uh, who is the sponsor and host of this series. And unfortunately, she's fallen ill, so she cannot be uh, with us today. Uh, this means that uh, the honor of uh, introducing our speaker uh, falls uh, on me, and I'm doing that gladly. And I usually don't read out an introduction before lectures, but uh, since this is so rich that for the sake of precision, I have chosen to mostly read. Uh, our distinguished guest, uh, Paul Lendvai, was born in Budapest in uh, 1929, and he fled Hungary after the crushing of the 1956 revolution. He found, home, found his new home in Vienna and became an Austrian citizen three years later in 1959. He started his career as a journalist in 1957 in the Presse, and a few years later also became the Financial Times correspondent for Eastern Europe, a position he held for more than two decades. He was a contributor to The Economist, and wrote columns for Austrian, German, and Swiss newspapers and radio stations. For the last 20 years, he has had a weekly column in Der Standard as well. In 1981, he became editor-in-chief of the East, East European Department of the Austrian National Public Broadcasting Company, ORF. In 1789, 1787, sorry, Paul Enver became director general of Radio Österreich International, a position he held for the next 12 years. Since 1973, he has also been the editor-in-chief and co-publisher of Europäische Rundschau, a Viennese international quarterly, and runs the monthly discussion panel Europa Studio of the OLF TV channel. He is the winner of numerous awards and prizes including the Karl Renner Award for Journalism from 1974. Uh, he was also uh, awarded the title Professor, although he, as far as I'm aware, never taught at a university in recognition of uh, his oeuvre by uh, the Austrian government. He's the recipient of the Gold Medal for Service to the City of Vienna, 1989, the Grand Gold Decoration, for services to the Republic of Austria, 2001, the Commander Cross 
with star of the Order of the Merit of the Republic of Hungary from 2003. That's between the two terms of the office of the present government. And most recently, the Concordia Prize for Lifetime Achievement awarded in the Austrian Parliament. He has also been an incredibly prolific author. He's just told me that uh, his 20th book is uh, uh, in press. Uh, you might ask him about the topic of that book. The name of the few is widely acknowledged the biography of Bruno Kreisky, Austrian Chancellor, Portrait of a Statesman, came out in 1972. His concise history of Hungary, translated also into English as a thousand years of victory in defeat. Uh, his first book on Austria, Inside Austria, New, New Challenges or Demons, 2010. Hungary, Between Democracy and Authoritarianism, in 2012. And Orban's Europe, uh, Orban, Europe's New Strongman, 2017. His latest book, just published in English, and which will be the subject of the talk tonight, is entitled Austria Behind the Mask, The Politics of a Nation Since 1945. Please welcome Professor Paul Lenfei and the Paul's Thank you very much. This is, ladies and gentlemen, a special event. Two slightly different accents, both from born Hungarians in Vienna. Which is, I think, the best tribute to this university, where a couple of months ago I had the honor of leading a discussion, and uh, it was quite interesting, international, and it was a bit sad because I am very glad that the university, being chased away, has found a place in Vienna. But it was a fantastic thing in Budapest. And it is a terrible blow, I think, to the founder of the university that his testament, the stones, the spirit in that building, that fantastic building, has been weakened through the attacks. And it's fantastic that. You can be here in Vienna, but it is a sad event. Anyhow, I am not going to talk about Hungary, but Austria. Um, I don't know how many of you are Austrians or German speakers. Uh, there is a great, has been a great Austrian actor who was more than an actor, Helmut Qualtinger. I had the honor of listening to him, although hardly understanding a word in those days. Um, he said once that Austria is a labyrinth, but every Austrian knows his way around. So this is, of course, uh, true. But nevertheless, uh, although I have been learning to be an Austrian for a few decades, since 1959, as you may have heard, uh, and has been working here, uh, it's a country which is very deceptive, surprisingly deceptive, because many people think that it is only good. You see, all the annual reviews of the cities worth living in, say Vienna, I think for the last eight or 10 years, um, I don't think my wife would agree with the author of these uh, results because she always finds that the way to come here, it's bad, it's worse, um, and and uh, she's getting really Viennese already, complaining. But this shows that she's assimilating as most Hungarians, as you know, do. So uh, the positive sign is, of course, 
that this is a country which survived incredible upheavals. If you think of it, if you are going around, we were walking yesterday, uh, we were looking in the Volksgarten where there are roses, you can pay. I just heard from our friend whose husband was a famous actor and there is one little rose, tree of roses there that it costs only 300, no, uh, 300 for two years or three years, 300 euros. If you have more money, you can now even rent a tree. So, and we were walking there and then we really felt that this was the capital of a country with 52 million, 52 million people. So it's unbelievable that uh, what's remained of this empire and what this country has gone through since the breakup of the Austro-Hungarian monarchy. You know, the Hungarians always mourn that Great Hungary has disappeared. There are even autos with the old maps of the, big, the Great Hungary. And uh, I haven't met anyone in Vienna who was sorry that the empire broke up. Uh, I haven't seen any cars with the Austro-Hungarian monarchy, although the German-speaking part lost more than the Hungarians. Anyhow, uh, it is a fantastic success story that you can speak about Austrians. When I came here on February 4, 57, in a very long borrowed winter coat from Prague, I didn't think, I didn't know that the people who were living here, only about 50% thought, or 40% that they are Austrians. Though the German experience between 1938 and 45 was a tremendous blow, but it took decades until the Austrians became Austrians. This is a country when it was founded, the Republic of Austria, Stefan Zweig mentioned it in his late, oldest, latest book, is the only country which in the first document already said that didn't want to remain independent. That was an incredible thing. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the biggest number of the foreign employees are from Germany. No one wants to go to Germany. The Germans are coming here to work or to the university to study. So in many ways, it is an incredible success story. I was here for 23 years, two years correspondent of the Financial Times, which I think is still the best paper in Europe, as I don't have any pension from them. I can say that, really, that it is true. Uh, the subscription costs somewhat more than the other pink paper, the standard, for which I am working now. But during these 22 years, one learned a lot about this country and also the incredible economic upswing. When I was editor of that quarterly you kindly mentioned, died after 44 years, lack of funds. It was a pleasure. I didn't have to beg for money. And uh, Austria was competing with Japan in the economic growth. Then there is something else. The great German philosopher Simmel said that compromise is one of the great inventions of mankind, that you don't find, don't fight each other, but find a way how to 
get on with each other. And this is something which was the key to Austria's success story after 1945, the compromise that quarreled industry and labor, and in the end, they found a way to get on with each other. And this compromise, of course, can be also bad. It can be bad when you have a compromise and at the same time, you don't pay attention to the productivity, to the international competition, and you sacrifice perhaps the future generation for the comfort of the present generation. But nevertheless, it was a great success story. Also, as far as social stability is concerned, as far as the lack of strikes. In the strike statistics, Austria was always lagging. At the moment, the metal workers are probably going to strike. It's not yet certain. It looks like it, but you never know whether in the end uh, they don't find a way. The great Russian revolutionary, writing his books and later in London, Herzen said that history has no libretto. And this is particularly true of Austria. The personalities played in the formation and in the entire history of the Second Republic, we say second because the first was between 1920 and 38, uh, played a very great role. And I can't go and I, into the details because then I lose uh, the audience if I mention too many names, but it's a country of surprises as far also the personalities are concerned. If you want to know something about Austria and you Google Austria and the history, you find always the names of Hitler, Waldstein, Haider, but you don't always find the names of Karl Renner, Bruno Kreisky, and others. It is a country which received Adolf Hitler, 200,000 people on the Heldenplatz. And when I mentioned that to the former chancellor, Bruno Kreisky, he said, yes, but you don't speak about the people who weren't there, who were weeping, or who were worrying about their friends, the Democrats, the monarchies, the enemies the, of the authoritarian regimes or the dictatorships. And in this country, where 200,000 people were jubilant about Hitler, in 19... 70. A then 60 year old Viennese Jew who spent 12 years in Sweden in emigration became the Chancellor of Austria. It was an incredible event and it meant something. I knew Bruno Kreisky, I had the great luck of meeting him and had the honor of writing the first biography, biographical essay with a colleague who was then the editor-in-chief of the Salzburger Nachrichten, a very respectable Bundeslander provincial daily. And it was actually Unbelievable that this man who didn't look very great, wouldn't have had a film, a role, a starring role in a Hollywood film. It's this man 
won five elections, three with absolute majority. I think the most successful politician in Europe. When he lost the last election, the Social Democratic Party had 27.8%. They would be, yeah, I'm sorry, 47.8% of the popular vote. And three times he won the absolute majority. But then, I must say, I have been always not very objective because I wrote his biography. I admired him. He was also responsible for the fact that Austria became the home of a very strong right-wing populist party, which are regarded by many as the, a threat to the freedom, but calls itself Freedom Party, Freedomites, because it was he who managed to get a single party government for the first time since 1945, because this Freedom Party had on those days only, I seem to remember, six or eight MPs, and he made an agreement with them that they will abstain from voting against the government so that the Social Democratic Party could form a minority government. And I write in this book about the political parties, the personalities, the histories. And on top of it, the head of this Freedomite Party was a former Waffen-SS officer who spent two years fighting Russians and allegedly killing Jews and communists and so on. And I knew that man too. In those days in Austria, you didn't want to know who, what did during the war in Germany or in Austria. And uh, it happened that I met this man several times and I believed in it that the leader of the Freedomites, those days called Friedrich Peter, became a Democrat. I was at you know, an official trip to Prague when nobody talked to him. And he told me I was leading away this party from the Nazis. He later left the party after the ablest man in those days, Jörg Haider, was a kind of flirting with the memories of the Third Reich. A very good looking man, a very complex personality, but anyhow. So Kreisky was an absolutely fantastic success story for Austria. Many people would say who are over 60 that this was the golden age. Austria was on the map of the world. But at the same time, he was also responsible for the fact that the FPÖ got a new electoral law. That was the price of supporting him. And as a result, it started to rise. And there was another very able Austrian politician whose name is Wolfgang Schüssel whom I also happen to know extremely well, of the People's Party, of the Conservatives, who also carried out a political wonder. Before the election in 1999, he said, if our party, the People's Party, won't be able, will not be able, to win or to become number two, then we shall go into opposition. As a matter of fact, the Freedomites surpassed them by 451 votes. So the People's Party became number three. You could have imagined this meant they are out in the wilderness. No, 
within a few weeks, Schisler, Wolfgang Schisler, the head of the People's Party was the new chancellor because he made an agreement with the Freedomites who supported him. That was in the year 2000. The Euro European Union, 14 other countries, started a protest movement against Austria and said they are not going to talk to Austrian diplomats, are not going to be invited to various events. It was a kind of sanctions, but very, very mild sanctions. But the Austrian population took it as an insult. And that government went on for two years when the Freedomite leader, who organized it together with Wolfgang Schüssel, torpedoed it because he couldn't bear it that not he was the number two in the government, but his assistant, who is currently the wife of the Austrian commissioner in the European Union. And so Jörg Haider, a highly able man, very complex, also in his private life, killed himself driving at 152 kilometers per hour in a path where it should have been only 70 or 60. He torpedoed it because he couldn't bear it. Even the vice chancellor, his assistant, his confidence, his person of confidence did not know that he was going to Saddam Hussein to visit him. Anyhow, uh, I just tell you these stories to show that behind the facade of the Ringstrasse and the Operetta, there are here popular things, personalities and events, which are incredibly interesting. Though Austria is only the 14th country in terms of size, in the European Union. Anyhow, and Schüssel reacted to the re revolt in the Freedom Party by calling new elections, and he had a fantastic success. He smashed the Freedomites. This People's Party got a tremendous victory. And he lost it two years later at the elections because underestimated the opponents and the party was accustomed to ruling and they lost the election. The Social Democrats took over again. Extremely able man. And his name is Gusenbauer. And this Chancellor had to leave after two years because he was extremely able, spoke three languages or four actually, four foreign languages, but he was somehow distanced from the people, didn't have a, a social feeling for the people, and was torpedoed by his own party. Anyhow, the point is what I want to say, that the Freedomites are always rising after people thought they were smashed. After 2004, too, when um, Schüssel called these elections, and they went down from 26 to 18 or 16 percent, one thought they are eliminated. At the moment, they are again at 20-30% in the polls. Of course, it's not the election result. In this book, which is uh, Austria Behind the Mask, I spoke for the, why I was writing it and before writing it with 55 people, including the present head of the Freedom Eyes, uh, Herbert Kicker, who was surprised that I wanted to talk to him. 
I was surprised that he received me. So we had a very pleasant three hours conversation. But it was in those days when the chancellor was still the young wonder boy of Austrian politics, Sebastian Kurz. So we spoke mainly about him, Kurz, and not about the politics of the Freedomites, because Mr. Kickel was in the first black, they called it Turkeys, blue colored rather, with blue black, not no longer black. And the Freedomites in this coalition, he was the Minister of Interior. Anyhow, uh, the Freedomites, and this is the reason why Austria today has not very good publicity in the British, French, American press because of the growing danger that for the first time in a democratic country, the far right would take over the premiership, the chancellor. And this is one of the one of the reasons why Austria is now no longer regarded as a success story, but rather a country which creates or reflects the problems of modern politics. And the freedomites. Uh, today demand that Austria should not condemn the Russian aggression against the Ukraine. They say this is not a neutral position. They accuse the government of destroying neutrality. Many people forget that this party was against neutrality and was against also entering the common market. They are now playing the game of the Austrian Patriots, which are the highest party. This is one of the reasons why Austria is now, as an Austrian historian wrote in his book, under observation once again under observation. The second reason is the corruption. And now I come to the person who was another miracle in Austrian politics. His name is Sebastian Kurz. He became at the age of 24 Secretary of State. At the age of 27, foreign minister, the youngest in the world, and at the age of 31, prime minister, chancellor, the youngest in the world. And now he is on trial for false statements. He denies everything. And there is another Trial probably prepare, being prepared against him for a much heavier, weightier reasons is that corruption, placing advertisements in popular papers in order to get good publicity and preparing thereby also forged opinion polls. Uh, now he is the youngest former chancellor in Austrian history, was twice prime minister, and the first Kurz government as chancellor, he made a coalition again with the Freedomites. But this coalition, ladies and gentlemen, generally speaking in the Austrian press, they write the Freedomites were during the 40, last 40 years, four times in the government. Yes, they were after Kreisky left. 
they were also on the schüssel and they were now they became now together with Kurt in 2017 in the coalition government. But this was different. Why? Because what everyone said about the first coalition, black and blue under Schüssel, there was a very attractive finance minister who turned out to have been a great embezzler of public funds and pocketing a lot of money according to a not final judgment, court judgment sentencing him to eight years. There were people who were corrupt, there were people who were not able, but they didn't pose a direct threat to the democracy, perhaps because they were too occupied getting money. But on the courts, in order to be able to break the gross Rosa coalition, the great coalition, he not only accepted the freedomites, but offered them on a silver plate the foreign ministry, the interior ministry, the defense ministry, the national bank. It's unbelievable. The result was the Ministry of Interior, they destroyed the intelligence service so much that other Western agents in the services for some time didn't want to cooperate with us. The coalition to collapse after almost two years but not because of the popular demonstrations, because of the strength of the civil society. Not, therefore. It collapsed because there was a secret recording on an island of e conversations between the leaders of the Freedomite Party the head of the party and the head of the parliamentary faction with someone whom they thought was the niece of a Russian oligarch. And they were freely talking about this, taking over a newspaper, or how much does it cost, etc. This was, became, this happened in 2017, but became known in 2019. And this finished the government. And after a pause, Sebastian Kurz, the Wonder Boy, won the second elections, raising the People's Party's vote, popular vote, from 31 to 37 percent, not reaching, achieving that what Schüssel did, 42 percent, but almost. And then he set up a green, a green black, a black-green coalition with the Green Party, which previous four years wasn't in politics, whose former head is now the federal president. And this wonder boy of the Austrian politics, it turned out, was personally involved in, according to the Attorney General's office and the office fighting the corruption in all kinds of shady deals. And how these deals became known, that was the second surprise in Austrian politics. The first was one, the secret recording and of this recording and pictures, photos, live, incredible things about these conversations between the oligarch Sneeze and the Freedomite leadership, that was the one political bomb. The second political bomb was that all the major corruption things or um, in influencing the political situation through polls, which were not genuine polls, but were made out to be 
genuine polls by a pollster who got money for it. And this became known because the key person, the Secretary General of the Finance Ministry, loved to talk to people, chat, destroyed. He thought he destroyed everything, but forgot that there was another machine in his flat when there was a search by the police, and they found, in addition to compromising sexual photos, allegedly 2,500, 400 pages long of incredible chats with the chancellor of when he was foreign minister, he was preparing already to take over the government. Once again, in Austria, you say Unschuld's Vermutung, which means that the former chancellor denies it. And this was the key thing that these chats became known and are the basis of the prosecution's case against not only Sebastian Kurz, but others too. And you don't have to worry about him at the moment because he is working as a special ambassador for Peter Thiel, a very controversial American investor and uh, a uh, great advisor and supporter of Trump. But also he set up his own company, and in the first year he already earned 1.9 million euro. But this shows that the political wonder boy can also be very, very successful in the economy. Finally, the uh, third problem, which makes Austria's position less flattering, is the ties with Russia. There are several figures who played a great role in forging a too close relationship with Russia. There is a very successful um, enter entrepreneur who was also working closely with President Putin personally together before the Sochi Winter Olympic Games because he was running here a motor company and he does it too and did it in Russia. He was a man or he is a man, his name is Sigrid Wolf, who is who sent messages to the Austrian Chancellor while he was visiting. Washington, that he should talk to the U.S. Secretary of Treasury and the Foreign Ministry that one Russian company should be taken off the list of the sanctions because he was working for this company and said to him, Sebastian, you should talk and arrange that. It hasn't been denied by Sebastian Kurz. So this man also said that, yes, one criticizes Russia, but this is a country which really works. A bit of the democratur, he expressed himself, would be good for Austria too. And this man, the former chancellor, wanted to appoint the, uh, to the chairman of the supervisory board of the nationalized and public services, which are about 38 billion euro worth. Anyhow, and then there was an Austrian foreign minister called, uh, I forgot his the name, Kles, Kles, eh? yeah, Kneisel, thank you very much, Kneisel. I knew her, she was working, left the foreign ministry. I even admired her because she left the foreign ministry to work as a commentator and journalist, but it turned out there was something very, very wrong with her. And she became foreign minister of Austria. She wasn't member of the Freedom Party, but she was proposed 
And uh, the then chairman of the Freedom Minds even said, Mrs. Kneisel is the female Christ. And this foreign minister married after many years her boyfriend, who was already, I think, 55 or something. And at the wedding appeared the reception, Vladimir Putin danced with the Austrian foreign minister, who cursed to him after the dance. And not only that, he gave her a beautiful necklace worth 50,000 euro. She was protesting that she had to give it in because according to the Austrian law, presents which you get when you are in official function, you should give it back. Anyhow, this showed that she was very much respected by President Putin, which is a rather unusual thing, that he comes to the wedding reception. And then he later, when the government collapsed, he got, she got a very good job at Rosneft, allegedly 500,000 euro a year, but she had to leave it because the European Union put her otherwise on the blacklist. So she left it, she lived in Lebanon, and she is now in Russia and has a think tank and earns quite well with her um, commentaries for the Russian propaganda outfit, the former Austrian foreign chancellor, foreign minister. This is also a remnant of the Kurz government. This is the third reason why Freedomized corruption and the closeness of some key people to Russia, which cast a shadow over Austria's image and standing. And of course, also the Kurz government and he himself has very good relations with Hungary, with Mr. Orban. He gave a talk in Budapest. And there were now several films about him. And in one of the films, starts, he has a book by a man called Balaj Orban, not a relative of Viktor Orban, about the strategy of Fidesz. And uh, he also got already a decoration from Mr. Vucic, the president of Serbia, not exactly a credential of democratic uh, ideas. And... Uh, this was also another reason why in the European Union, Austria's standing has become different. So now the government is in Austria, Aus um, People's Party and the Greens, and next year there will be the elections. At the moment, it looks that the Freedomites are the strongest party. There is a crisis in the Social Democratic Party, absolutely incredible factional and fights between various persons, not for political reasons, but for reasons of standing, of power. They managed to torpedo the first female president of the chairwoman of the party who tried somehow to keep it together. There are two small parties, the Greens in the government and the Neos, who are critical of the pro-Russian orientation. But nevertheless, the fact remains that Austria is, despite the closeness of Hungary and Serbia and the ties to Russia, and the fact that due to the former government and also for the indirect responsibility of courts, Austria is totally relying, almost totally, on Russian gas. And there was an agreement signed while in the background Putin and Kurz were smiling jovially for prolonging this treaty, this agreement until 2040. And all this left, of course, a relic 
and this affects the standing of the People's Party. And there is one more factor which I want to stress at the end. I already speaking too long. Uh, it is that Austria is also a federal country with nine provinces, nine lands. And there is not a word in the constitution about the Bundesland conference, but there is an informal conference, the Landeshauptleiter, the governors of the lender of the nine provinces. And the point is, ladies and gentlemen, that the federal, I just want to read that part, I prepared it. The federal government means that all attempts to reform the federal structures based on the power of the nine provinces have failed. 20 years ago, 70 experts worked on a reform for two years in vain, producing almost a thousand pages of evidence and proposals. The conference of the nine provincial governors, the Landeshauptleiter conference, meeting twice yearly, with a rotating chairmanship is not mentioned in the Constitution at all, but it is regarded as being, in fact, more powerful than the government. Stability at the top plays a decisive role. The ÖVP, the People's Party, for example, has provided the governor in Lower Austria, Tirol, and Vorarlberg for 77 years. <laughs> And the SPU has provided the governor in Vienna for 77 years and in Burgenland for 58 years. So there was only one Austrian politician who left the governorship to become chancellor. That was Josef Klaus in 1960, 62. He became first finance minister, then chancellor was a great reformer, a decent person. He left the governorship of the province of Salzburg, but no one else. Because to be a governor is much safer than to sit in Vienna and be somehow at the mercy of the various groups in the parties and in the provinces. So it is somehow a basic weakness of this country that you, like a marriage of convenience, you can't live without the provinces and you can't live with the provinces. There is no way. Now at the moment there are the talks about the health system. How much money should they get? How much money will the federal government give? So it's a give and take, but this is part of the Austrian system. So I would say that the present situation, the Austrian politics and the Austria standing is full of dangers, but at the same time, this is a country with a free press, with a free public radio and television, with a very strong civil society and an intact system of justice, where even former ministers are sentenced and this is something which is, of course, also a guarantee that you can't overnight change the political system. It would be a grave danger if the freedomites really got to become the strongest party. But in Austria, the federal president has also a role to play. And let me tell you, finally, 
a few words about the person of the federal president. The federal president is an accident of history. The federal president, I wrote it, a famous Austrian actor said once, if one kills him because he's producer, actor, everything, Otti Schenk, he said, if he would be killed because his father was Jewish, his mother Italian, one wouldn't find a drop of German blood. Nor would one find in the federal president's body. He comes from a Russian, Estonian family with Dutch roots, and his parents were, fly, were fleeing from Estonia to Vienna and Austria, and he was born in Vienna. Had he been born in Budapest or by the late Balaton, he couldn't have become federal president of us. He came here, grew up in Tyrol. He speaks excellent Tyrolian and became an economist, university professor, chairman of the Green Party, and was now elected for the second time. So this, he has the power to some extent to block a takeover by the Freedomites and to push the other parties to form a coalition. So we shouldn't forget that there are not only 30% Freedomites supporters, but also 70% who are not for the freedom. So another very important item, which is perhaps not known abroad so well, that at the time, of the campaign against foreigners in Austria, the Ministry of Justice is held by a woman of 34 or 35 years old who came to this country at the age of 10 from Bosnia. And she became Minister of Justice, Alma Zadish. So these little things are also very important to understand this is a country of contradictions, of tremendous changes in history and worth living in. And I can only say that it is very, very good that this university found a place here. Thank you very much. Based almost surely 
found a amazing by the person experience of life cycle being and living in a little part of the atmosphere for all the I would love to bring that back. Uh, it says that uh, it's about the forces that are shaped Austrian politics for this country. Uh, I have a question about this, but more than that, uh, it's some of the forces about the forces that shape politics. It's about the identity and character, the nature of Austria as a state. As it comes across the uh, innumerable stories that are analytically presented uh, about the way that the Austrian politics is. Now, uh, I would like to invite the audience to ask questions which may uh, lead us further behind the mask. Uh, several features of the Austrian politics seem to be unmasked with the orc that. Um, thank you. Thank you for the talk. Um, so, again, my understanding of Austria is still very cursory, and I got a lot of information today. But I was a bit surprised that when you were talking about the persistence of FPO, uh, over the years, even though they haven't been in government, but their popularity doesn't seem to be declined. Uh, and in the explanation, racism and xenophobia never figured, right? And my impression, even when I was coming to Austria before studying, I was sort of warned by friends and family that, look, if you compare at least to Western Europe, Austria has this undercurrent of racism and xenophobia. And I've had contradictory experiences here. But recently, if we look at for example, how Austria voted on the UN resolution, how the Palestine protests were banned, the visa regime, the outright propaganda against immigrants, etc. It does seem to be quite starkly different from the discourse in Germany, let's say. So first, do you, un do you agree with my, uh, with my uh, point that, that there, is, there is this undercurrent of racism and xenophobia that's almost always been there? And second, do you think this is sort of something fundamental to the national narrative of the country? Um. Freedom. Yeah, uh, so basically uh, we, we disagreed uh, with one of your characterizations that you know, Austria has freedom of the press and freedom of the media. Maybe so far that was the case, but in the past month, we didn't feel like that. Like it was hardest in, in Austria, apart from Germany, in Europe, to satisfy and, you know, to not have our rights for free assembly of speech and media violated, um, most, uh, mostly concerning the, the conflict in Palestine and Israel. On that specifically, I think the reference is to the ban on uh, pro-Palestine protests. So it was more the freedom of assembly. Sorry, there have been demonstrations, so I, I I saw myself in part of Vienna. So I think that they are allowed. It is only they are not allowed to carry uh, posters which are against uh, the Austrian law. But I don't think that uh, any kind of 
demonstration is banned. It is generally speaking, the demonstrations always not very much liked by the Viennese because it means almost every Saturday when there is a demonstration, not about Palestine, but about every single issue, it, you you have an even greater traffic jam as you usually have. But uh, I don't think so that there is a, a limit to the expression of, of freedom. I don't think that that happens. A few days ago, I was informed there was going to be a walk for hope, light of hope, a demonstration against anti-Semitism and a demonstration to get the Jewish uh, people out again into their freedom. And it was very scarcely reported upon. Even on CNN did a re report today on Austria, how the anti-Semitism is growing and so on everywhere but not one word about the wonderful demonstration a few days ago where there were at least 30,000 people on the Heldenplatz demonstrating against anti-Semitism. That's, so, that's certainly true that it was a very, I wasn't there, but I, I, I saw it was certainly a very, very impressive uh, demonstration and uh, What's also important, perhaps, that the government representatives were there. Hi, thank you for the talk. I would have a question regarding the Green Party, because you have talked a lot about the FPU and UFLP, but how would you rate the role of the Green Party has played in power in the coalition over the last two, three years? Have they been an asset in keeping the democracy of Austria intact or have they compromised themselves? So if you have any thoughts on the Greens, how they have fared. Thank you. The Greeks. The Greens. Yes. Uh, a very good question. Sorry. The Greens uh, the Greens have been between ninety between two thousand seventeen and nineteen out of parliament. They didn't manage to uh, pass the bench which is uh, necessary in order to get into parliament. And it is the present vice chancellor who then, uh, I would say single-handedly, uh, Kogler uh, worked and managed uh, to bring them back with 40% of the votes. And uh, the question is uh, why they accepted the compromise with the uh, FAP, uh, the socialists were not strong enough and uh, were also in the throes of a crisis. So they agreed to form this government. It is a risky decision because there is a great chance or rather danger that they will be losing a lot of votes. They won in 2019 because many people were dissatisfied with the Social Democrats and voted for them. But now there is a so-called left-wing leader of the Social Democrats who should be elected this week as chairman. And uh, they might be losing and uh, to the left, and uh, there are also perhaps other small parties. So it's a danger that the dissatisfaction with the People's Party majority will also affect the Greens. So I think it's a toss up. It's very, very open whether the Greens 
I hope because it's important that they survive, but I am not sure that they will be able to get 14%. According to the polls now, they are between 8 or 9% behind the um, NEOs. Uh, so it is, it is uh, the Greens played a very important role with the making the climate issue, the fight against uh, corruption uh, into a major political issue. And they were somehow a bit like social democrats without the heritage of corruption and being in power for so many years. So they were representing something new, something different, and uh, they have some able people. Uh, every second MP is a woman, in contrast to the big parties. But it is very much a question whether they will be able to reach their present strengths. And that is the question whether there will be a three-party coalition uh, with the Social Democrats or perhaps with the FRP, which is rather unlikely at the moment. So there will be, there might be very interesting changes in the next, after next 12 months after the parliamentary elections. What will happen to the Greens, we shall see. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, um, hello, Mr. Valentine. Thank you very much for coming to, to see you. I think I'm probably one of the few Austrians here at CU, at least that I am aware of. Um, and so since I grew up, I know Mr. Landby from appearing on Austrian te television. So thank you very much for being a guest at our university. Um, I have one question. So at one point during your discussion, you mentioned that Austria is one of the first Western European countries um, that kind of um, is in danger of falling to a very far right party like the FPÖ. However, isn't that already the case in Italy. Don't we see a similar uh, situation in France where Marine Le Pen, for example, might be the next president? Isn't what happened in the US with Trump something that could also fit into the same kind of patterns? For me personally, even what happened with Brexit um, fits into that pattern of, uh, I mean, the Tories might not be a far right party, but in my opinion, they have shifted much further to the right over the last couple of years. So that all kind of fits into a yeah, Western European, but also American pattern. And Austria might be on the forefront of that. But does it really stand out as much as you might, if you have made it uh, sound during your presentation? That would be my question to you. And if I may say something, maybe to the, I think it was our, there are some of our students over there who were complaining that they are uh, freedoms are limited. In Austria, you're not allowed to run around with a swastika, for example, if you are a far-right Nazi, and rightly so. And similarly, you're not allowed to run around with a Hamas flag. And if you don't agree with that, that's fine, but I strongly um, disagree with you in that case. Um, sorry, maybe I misunderstood you, but <laughs> if it was about running around with Hamas flags, then um, yeah, I don't think that your freedoms are limited. But yeah, sorry, that was my question. I just wanted to say something to our students there. Thank you very much. I think that uh, uh, perhaps I exaggerated. Uh, certainly, there are also problems in uh, other countries, Finland, for instance, which no one expected that, or also in Sweden. But um, but it is in the European Union, it would be the first time. And of course, the far right, the danger is that not only in Austria, it's also the same in France, that the danger is when center right parties, which have been making, forging coalitions with center left, 
like social democrats or liberals, are trying to preempt the ex far right by taking up some of the um, proposals and even the style. And this is also in Austria, of course, a danger with regarding to the refugees, uh, with regard uh, to the migrants issue, uh, with regard to the help for the people. And this is, of course, not only true of Austria. And of course, the real danger when we are talking about Europe is the war against the Ukraine. And the real danger is that in the United States, uh, the system doesn't work. And uh, the fact that the Republicans have uh, been willing in uh, the U.S. Congress that a small group of extreme right-wing and uh, bigot and, and stupid uh, politicians managed to block major issues. This is now when $14 billion for the Ukraine are held up, uh, $60 billion for the Ukraine are held up, and uh, they are against it. So it is a very, very serious danger. And uh, I think that uh, Austria is just a small example because you have the danger in Germany, where the uh, alliance for Germany, IFD, is winning, uh, becoming number one in three East German provinces. And, and there are dangers too in, in France. And in Italy, you have uh, a far right party and the coalition, but at the same time, uh, the uh, economic forces are very major factors. No one would have imagined that the post-fascist prime minister of Italy is trying to carry out the same uh, economic policy of reforms what her predecessor did. So the strength, the force of the of the economic factors can uh, push even right-wing governments towards the center. It true also of left-wing governments. For instance, Greece survived a very serious crisis under a left-wing prime minister. As a result, he lost the elections, as it often happens when you are doing the right things, like Schroeder did it in Germany. So it's a complex situation. And uh, and uh, I think uh, I came here when Austria was a lightning example of liberalism, freedom for many, many people in Eastern Europe. And I very much hope that this country will remain the same example, despite the fact that the far right is so strong, they were also strong in 1919, they were also wrong, strong in 2017. We don't have, can't have every year an Ibiza scandal that people are showing up who they are really, but I think that uh, uh, that is the fantastic in history, that surprises uh, are always possible. And this is also true uh, of Austria. Uh, there could be crises which uh, heal and uh, prepare something better. And we shall see what will happen in a year's time. But in generally speaking, we are living in as Bert Brecht said, in Finster and Zeiten, in dark times. That is true. And that's a fantastic thing that you can discuss such things in uh, the university. And uh, in 
Hungary, as I just heard today uh, from the best source, who is my wife, that uh, the director of the of the uh, National Museum was kicked out, although he was a very strong pro orban right wing man, because uh, there were protests against uh, that under eighteen years old can't visit a photo, the world press photo exhibitions, because they would be corrupted by seeing lesbian or homosexual people. And he allowed it, despite protests that it shouldn't be forbidden and everybody can go there. And he was even very happy that the great queue was there to see all these photos. Within 24 hours, he was kicked out. So this is better that here in this country, the situation is different. And uh, uh, But anyhow, there are lurking dangers. And uh, it's very important that small countries are uh, protected. And I am very, very much impressed, I may say so. I don't know whether there are any people here from Scandinavia or that how the former Soviet republics, the Baltic republics, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, how well they are and they were doing. And uh, incidentally, I am very surprised and very now very curious whether Donald Trump will accept the invitation of President Zelensky to visit the Ukraine to see for himself what is the real situation in the Ukraine. And I think that's also a key issue and the dividing line. Who are the, which are the countries which support and which are like Hungary and now also Slovakia, which are against supporting with deliveries of weapons the Ukraine which fights for survival. So all these things are problems and also the the reception and the treatment of the refugees. So anyhow, I'm getting now too far away and thank you anyhow for the question. We, we, we may have uh, time for one last question. If there is ambition to ask one. Hi, thanks very much for the uh, talk. I'd like to hear you comment on the cultural significance of neutrality. Um, it's something that is puzzling to outsiders because historically it, it was an imposition of the Soviet Union, uh, even if formally it was it was uh, uh, agreed by the Austrian parliament. And yet it's something that's celebrated annually, uh, is something that is obviously very deep because Unlike Sweden and Finland, Austria didn't seriously consider NATO membership in response to the Russian invasion. So how did it become something uh, culturally deeply significant in Austria? Yes, I'm sorry I forgot to deal with the neutrality. Uh, it's an important issue. One thing is extremely important. Neutrality. 1955 was voted by parliament forever because of the state treaty day when the state treaty came into power and the four power occupation Austria was finished and and the neutrality became a basic factor in forging an Austrian identity and uh, today, if you ask the people whether they are in favor of neutrality, not joining NATO, but just in favor of neutrality, all opinion polls are between 70 and 80 percent are in favor of neutrality. Now, you can see what's the essence of neutrality. The essence of the neutrality is simply that Austria is not allowed and doesn't want to have any kind of foreign troops 
foreign military bases in on the Austrian territory, but it did not preclude Austria's membership in the United Nations, in contrast to Switzerland, didn't preclude Austria's membership in the European Council of Europe, and Austrian soldiers are stationed to, now is today is too in 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 the Middle East and they were in Cyprus and other places. This was an active neutrality. Now there are people who say it's a danger to Austria's security. I can tell you, I regard it a greater danger that we have a minister of defense, a lady who is a very good agricultural expert, allegedly, but had never anything to do with the administration of a ministry, let alone of the Ministry of Defense. I regard that, I even wrote it a bit more uh, cautiously, uh, a, a serious danger because Austria should have the armed forces. But I recall also a visitor from Oxford many years ago when I was working for the Financial Times, when I told him Austria spends more on the theaters than on the army, he said he would like to live in a country like this. So in a, it is a very selfish position. You are in Windstille. You leave it to the others to fight for you. But also, who will attack Austria? All our neighbors, except Switzerland, are in an alliance. The almost all of them. And so, I think personally that there are more important issues for Austria than whether they, Austria gives up neutrality. I don't think there is any possibility of having a majority for Austria joining the military alliance, I mean the NATO, in the foreseeable future. So I don't think, I think the issue is not really a burning issue because it doesn't really matter for the European defense, whether Austria is a member or not. And for Austria, it's much more important that inside the country, the Russian influence should be curtailed. The so-called Putin friends shouldn't be in positions of power in the government or in the administration. Much more important whether you say you are no longer neutral. Sweden and Finland are in a different position. And uh, so I personally, Antrenu, I would say it's not a burning issue for Austria. Thank you very much. I think uh, we are just at the end of our time, uh, although uh, there's a small reception uh, next door. So if uh, you wish to continue this in a more informal environment with our distinguished speaker, you can do that. But uh, before that, uh, I suggest that we thank heartfully uh, the wonderful presentation and uh, the stimulating discussion.